Now, as we start this morning looking at the Ten Commandments and ending our time in the Ten Commandments, I want to start with a question that I think is relevant to all of us. Here it is. My question for you, do you think that you're a good person? Objectively, like, do you think you're a good person? Well, let's find out. <laughs> I need five volunteers, which is probably the worst way to get volunteers is starting with that question. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going to interrogate you. You're going to be part of an illustration. I need five people to, to help me out. Raise your hand. Come on, Rebecca. Come on, I have two. Come on, Danny. I need two more people. Come on up. Uh, I have four. Uh, I need one more. Yeah, yeah, come on, come on. Yep, five. Perfect. Okay, I need you to make a line right here. What we're going to do to start the sermon is to solve the issue of morality. <laughs> right here this morning on Easter Sunday. We're going to determine if you're a good person, okay? So this is actually going to be our line of morality. So, uh, Rebecca, tell everyone your name. Rebecca. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and what's your name? Hannah. Rebecca, Hannah, Taina, Danny, Danny Irene. Irene. Okay. So this is our line of morality. And congratulations, Rebecca. No, again. Yes. <laughs> you are the greatest human being to ever live. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she says she wants to switch. That's something a good person would say, by the way. What'd you say? This is very appropriate. Yeah, yeah. Rebecca, I mean, she's a, a child's oncologist. She has like a 4.0 and everything. Uh, so, yeah, this fits. You're a great person, right? Um, not actually. You're going to represent somebody else, okay? And then you're going to be Irene. I'm sorry. You're the worst human being to ever live. <laughs> <laughs> not actually, but in this situation, right? And so, and you're going to be the average person. The, the, like the most par, regular, in-between human being ever. And then, Hannah, you're in-between good, like ultimate good and average. So you're like pretty good. Yeah, yeah. and he's subpar, exactly. <laughs> Danny, you're not the worst to ever live, but you're not great either. So, okay, so to make this come alive, what I need from you, I need help from you is, could you just go ahead and shout out to me the name of a human being that's lived, that is the greatest person to ever lived. Don't say Jesus. We're not in Sunday school. So an actual person that's not God, uh, a, a normal, everyday person. Name, shout out a name for me. The best person to ever live. Martin Luther King. Someone said Martin Luther King. Great answer. Uh, civil rights, all that. Yep. Okay. <laughs> all right, Irene. You, I'm sorry to say, that are the worst human being to ever live. So go ahead and shout out a name of the worst person you can think of. Hitler. What was the other name? Someone last summer said Taylor Swift. I don't know why. <laughs> it was horrible, yeah. And then I did good, and they said Taylor Swift again. And then I did average, and they did Taylor Swift again. Anyway. All right, so we have, on our scale of good to evil, the best person to ever live is Martin Luther King Jr., an icon in our society. And then the worst person to ever live is Hitler. And in between, who's somebody who's just, let me scoot in right here. Who's somebody who's just average? Who's kind of like right in the middle human being when it comes to the scale of morality? Go ahead and shout out a name. Some, last service, someone said uh, Jake from State Farm. <laughs> I thought that was a good answer. So just shout out somebody who's like in between middle, not great, but not horrible. Go ahead and shout out a name. Ryan Seacrest. <laughs> I love that answer. Like he gave us American Idol, but he's kind of overdone it. So right in the middle, we got Ryan Seacrest. Who's somebody who's not Martin Luther King good, but he's he or she is better than Ryan Seacrest. Who we got for here? Give me a name. Bob Ross. Bob Ross. <laughs> I like that. The, you know, the painter on Netflix? He's so tender and gentle. I, yeah, I think Bob Ross is a good answer. All right, now, and who's our name for somebody who's not Hitler-level bad, but is worse than Ryan Seacrest? It's Jeff Bezos, okay. Uh, <laughs> Hope you're not watching, Jeff. <laughs> we can go with Jeff Bezos, sure. I mean, I don't really know his life, but we'll just say Jeff Bezos. Um, anybody else have a name? Someone said Biden. We're not going to go political here. 
Oh, give me another name. Someone who's worse than Ryan Seacrest and better than Hitler. Kanye is a great answer. <laughs> Especially the last year. We're going to go with Kanye right here. All right, last service, someone said Draymond Green. Because he gets a bunch of technical fouls, I guess. I don't know. All right, so let's review. In our scale of morality, we have on the ultimate good, Martin Luther King Jr. Then we have, uh, who were you again? Bob Ross, yes. <laughs> you are Ryan Seacrest. Danny, you're Kanye. <laughs> Post-2010, Kanye. And, and you are, sadly, Hitler. Uh, actually, last service, the bad person was Hitler, and the guy had a crazy mustache, so I thought that worked well. Uh, okay, so here's my question for you. Where are you on this scale? Like, honest assessment, between Martin Luther King and Hitler, where are you at? Sherry, where would you put yourself? <laughs> Sherry actually won Best Christian Award in high school, so she's got to be at least, like, right here, right? Now, where is the line, then, where you suddenly tip over the scale and become a good person? Like, where's the threshold here? Is it right past Ryan Seacrest? Or before? Where's the line to get in heaven? Is it just be better than Ryan? Or just be better than, who are you again? Kanye? <laughs> you see how silly this is? This is what we do with morality. Now, <laughs> let me just blow it up for you. Do you know Martin Luther King Jr. was an adulterer? He did a thousand amazing things, revolution our society. Do you know, uh, some people will put Gandhi here. You know, Gandhi was charged with pedophilia. Last service, someone put Mother Teresa here. You know, she was charged with abusing her employees. You see, even the people who are on this side of the scale that we think are great have secrets, have sins. You know what the scripture says? The scripture says that even doing one sin puts you on the other end of the scale. So are you a good person? Let's give these folks a round of applause. And you guys, you guys can go ahead. The reason I did this to start is because the common belief in our city, the common belief in our society is that it doesn't matter what religion you are. It doesn't matter what lifestyle you live. It doesn't matter what your sexual preference is. It doesn't matter what gender you choose. Everyone in our society, on the mass majority scale, think that the only thing that matters is that you're a good person. That's it. And maybe you've thought that. The only thing that matters is I'm a good person. The only problem with that is that which definition of good are we using? What does being a good person even really mean? And because in our day and age... This scale looks different in every culture. We're just arguing over it. In fact, if I, for example, had, if, if there was an American woman in a scantily clad bikini and standing here, don't think about it like that. That's a breaking of one of the commandments. We'll get to that later. But imagine a woman in a bikini right here, American woman, and next to her is a Middle Eastern woman wearing a hijab covered head to toe and covering her entire body. Both of those people, the woman in the bikini and the woman in the hijab, would look at each other, point a finger, and say, you're doing a damage to femininity. They would look at each other and say, what you're doing is wrong. That's not good. So whose definition of good is good? Because the American woman looks over at the Muslim woman and says, what an oppressive, what a regressive culture. I can't believe they would force you to wear that and do that. You don't have a career. You don't have rights. That's so wrong. And the Muslim woman points her finger at the American woman in the bikini and says, oh my gosh, how exploitative, how manipulative, how degrading. That's a danger to women. 
And here's the thing, without an objective outside moral truth, we're all just pointing fingers at each other, legislating our standard of righteousness. When we actually have no idea what good is. We can't come to a common definition. And for you to, uh, to legislate your morality on another culture, for the American woman to look at the Middle Eastern woman and say, you need to take on our culture's values. Do you realize that's colonialism? That's Western imperialism? That's assuming your culture is better than theirs? And what our culture has done in the West is we have eradicated any absolute truth. We've eradicated any uh, undergirding solid uh, definition of what good is. We've said, your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth. What's good for you is good for you. What's good for me is good for me. And what we do is fine. They say there's no such thing as absolute truth. Which, by the way, do you realize that that claim is an absolute truth? To claim that there's no absolute truth is a declaration of absolute truth. So the whole worldview falls in on itself. And friends, this is why... God gave us the Ten Commandments. A supreme being outside of creation, who's divine, who's sovereign, is like a teacher coming into the classroom where the five-year-olds are arguing, what's one plus one? No, it's three. No, it's four. No, it's seven. And God says, this is what's good. My law. And so what I want us, invite us to do today is to actually evaluate how good we are. To create your own personal scorecard. Many of you are, you know, geniuses, doctors. Maybe you didn't do do so well in school. That's okay. You know what it's like to take a test. We're going to take a spiritual test by using the Ten Commandments. Now, I I recognize there are people in this room who were probably thinking, I was hoping we'd talk about Easter, not the Ten Commandments on Easter. But what I want to say to you is you can't appreciate Easter until you understand the Ten Commandments. Because your wonder of Easter is directly correlated to your awareness of your own brokenness. There's a famous painter named Rembrandt who was famous for using uh, paintings of light. And his secret, he said, was not the, the streaks of light that he painted, but the amount of time Rembrandt spent darkening the canvas so that the streaks of light appeared all the more brilliant in the painting. And in the same way, you will never understand the wonder of Jesus's resurrection until you see the darkness that Jesus penetrated and saved you from. Now you might not be a Christian and you're here, you're of a different faith, you're an atheist, you're a Muslim, or maybe you've never been to a a religious gathering before. You, You might be thinking, why should I even care about the Ten Commandments? That's not my standard of righteousness. But I would say to you, trust me, you do care about the Ten Commandments and you do believe them. How do I know? Because if I told you that the person next to you was going to break all the Ten Commandments in the next hour, you would change your seat or leave. And if I told you that there's a neighborhood in Baltimore where every citizen obeys the Ten Commandments all the time, every time, you would be like, where? I'm moving there. You see, you really do value the Ten Commandments. You really do agree with them at the very basis of who you are because God ingrained them in you. And so let me ask you, how do you measure up to God's standard of goodness? Go ahead. uh, As we go through each of these, I want you to track your scorecard. Yes or no? I've always obeyed this commandment, or no, I've broken this before. First commandment. God says, thunders from Mount Sinai, and he says, you shall have no other gods before me. So let me ask you, friend, can you say, I have never put anything before God in my entire life? He has always been the chief object of my affections, my thoughts, my actions. God has always been the thing I get most excited about. Not a new romance or a job promotion or a car or my possessions or the people's opinions of me. No, no, they're all second to him. Could you say that? Yes or no? Well, when I look at my life, I spent a lot of my time and, and energy more excited about the things God made more than I have the creator of those things. So that's a big one in the L column for me. We're 0 for 1 over here. I don't know about you. All right, number two. You shall have no carved images of me. Oh, I'm, I'm good here. I've never worshipped like the image of an eagle or something. I, I, I'm not bowing down to cows. 
I haven't made a carved image of God. Well, this commandment's more about, the heart of it is reshaping God more into your liking. It's believing wrong things about him because you prefer he'd be a different way. So let me ask you, have you always consistently worshipped him for who he is, not what you want him to be? Have you fully believed his word without wishing he were different? Have you ever said or thought, I could never believe in a God that blank. I could never believe in a God that would send people to hell. I could never believe in a God that condemns my sexual preference. I could never believe in a God that wants 10% of my money. I could never believe in a God that blank. If you've ever said that, you've broken this commandment. How are we doing? Oh, we're just getting started. Commandment number three, God says, you shall not take my name in vain. So this can be using Jesus Christ as an exclamation point, but it's more than that. Have you always held God in the highest respect? Have you always represented his name well? Have you always, if you call yourself a follower of God, have you always done what he would want you to do? And if not, you've degraded his name. Yes or no? Fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath. In our American consumeristic culture, you kidding me? We stink at this one. The Swiss are laughing at us. They got like 27 vacation days and like a five-month paternity leave. We're over here working every day. Let me ask you, do you this, this commandment really, what it gets at is, do you give to God what fully belongs to him? And included in that, have you consistently given God one day a week set aside to know him more, to worship him more with your brothers and sisters in the faith? And deeper than that, do you find your identity, the core of who you are, similar to what Devin said, in what you accomplish or what your resume says or what your GPA is or what, how high your 401k is? Or do you find your identity in being God's child? And if you were trying to prove yourself through your work, your achievements, you're breaking the fourth commandment. Fifth commandment, honor your parents. Now, this has to do with how we relate to authorities in our life. Your parents are the first represent, representation of God's authority to you. The spirit of this commandment, therefore, is have your li- throughout your life, have you responded with honor towards authorities? Can you say I've not disobeyed or dishonored my parents or any authority above me? I've consistently respected them, given them willing obedience. Kids, look at your parents. They're shaking their head. No, you have not. Now, obviously, let me just add a brief caveat here. If somebody steps outside God's will and uses their authority to abuse you, to guilt you, to shame you, God's command here is not obey them. It's following God's authority when they're in alignment with the scriptures. So this is not saying stay in abusive situations. This is get the heck out. But those who have led you, have you as best you could, when they haven't sinned against you, honored them. This goes down to government authority, your councilman, the president, the police. Have you honored? Yes or no? Sixth commandment, you shall not kill. And you say, finally, one in the wind column. I have not killed anyone. I, maybe. <laughs> well, the problem is Jesus came along and messed that one up because he said to hate someone in your heart, to desire harm upon another human being is to murder them in your heart. So can you say, not only have I never murdered someone, I have never had a hateful thought. I've never taken the slightest pleasure in seeing harm or misfortune upon another human being, even my enemies. Yes or no? Some of you are like, I violated this trying to find a parking spot today. (laughs) We're in the city, man. It's tough. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. You know, you might say in the same way, I'm good on this one. I'm not even married. Well, Jesus messed this one up for you too, because he said to think lustful thoughts about someone you're not married to is committing adultery in your heart. So can you say, I have never entertained thoughts about physical intimacy with someone I am not married to? Yes or no? Eighth commandment, you shall not steal. Can you say, I've never taken anything that doesn't belong to me? Not credit I didn't deserve, not a pack of gum taken from the grocery store. 
Not even an answer from my classmate on a test. You ever fudged a number before? Tax day is coming up, April 15th, your favorite day. Maybe you think, man, I don't I'm not going to be honest with my taxes. These people waste my money. I don't trust the people in office anyway right now. I need this money more than they need it. So you steal thinking, who's this really hurting? That's breaking the eighth commandment. Have you always given fully to others what they're entitled to? Have you never defrauded your employee or employer by surfing Facebook or binging on YouTube while you're on the clock? Can you say, I've always been completely truthful in all my dealings? Yes or no? Ninth commandment, you shall not lie. I don't even have to go over this one. But can you say, I've never lied or slandered another human being? I've never exaggerated the truth for my own benefit. I've never covered up faults so I look better or hidden awkward things about myself. I've always told the truth in every situation to every person I know. Are you completely honest all the time? Yes or no? Last commandment, you shall not covet. Now, this is the clearest one. Can you say, I've never been greedy for something that wasn't mine or jealous of somebody else's abilities, looks, possessions, positions? I'm fully content with what I have. If you've watched the HGTV channel, you've probably broken this commandment. I feel like that entire channel is built on coveting. I look at those guys like building houses and think, man, I'd be such a better human being if I could do what they do. My wife would love me so much more. I'm coveting. Look at that bathroom, two sinks. Oh my goodness. You see, when when you hate your job, are you able to celebrate with your friend who just landed their dream job? When you're single, can you rejoice with your best friend who just got engaged? If your coworker gets recognized and promoted by your boss, are you content even though you didn't? If you've been trying to get pregnant for months, years, and someone you know just accidentally got pregnant out of wedlock, are you bitter or at peace? Are you like the oil tycoon John Rockefeller who so famously said when he was asked, how much money is enough? He said, just a little bit more. Or are you more like Jesus and the Apostle Paul who said, the only things I need to be content are food and clothing? Yes or no? Are you a coveter? Now, can I be honest with you? I'm 0 for 10, man. The pastor is 0 for 10. I've broken all these. I haven't murdered anyone that I know of, but I've hated people in my heart. And I'm guessing you're pretty close to that too. Now, many of you were in school or just recently graduated. If you get a zero on an exam in class, do you really think you're going to pass the class? Like what institution will let you in with a 0 out of 10 on all your scores. You can't even get into community college with that record. And that is why in this text in Exodus chapter 20, the people hearing God declare what goodness really is. And in God's presence, how do they respond when they realize they're 0 for 10? Verse 18, it says, When The people, Israel, saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. The people were afraid and trembled. And they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we'll listen. But don't let God speak to us or we'll die. The people are so aware of their brokenness that they're like, we don't want to be near God. He's going to crush us. And... (laughs) We're so desperate to make God not terrifying that we knock all the teeth out of the line of Judah. God is terrifying. And that is why Israel is afraid here. This is a good rational fear of a holy God. And as your parent, you, like, you know, you want your kids to have a good rational fear. I want my kid to be afraid of the intersection of the street. 
not like you need therapy afraid of the street and go to a counselor, but they should have a healthy, rational fear of the cars that are whizzing by their home. And in the same way, this text is saying, you should have a healthy, rational fear of a holy God with a good law that you have broken. And what will stay his hand? Nothing. What will he do with sin? He will bring justice and wrath upon sinners. Sinful people stand between God and his justice. And that is why Israel is trembling, begging God not even to come near them. And we should be trembling too. Any sane person would be. Have you told a lie? Yes. Have you looked lustfully at another human being? Yes. Have you coveted something that isn't yours? Yes. Have you loved someone more than you love God? Yes. So then by your own admission, you would say that you're a lying, adulterous, coveting idolater. And we're just covering four of the ten. So let me ask you, are you a good person? Do you deserve heaven or hell? Does God let liars and coveters and idolaters into perfect paradise? Now, the instant reaction is, no, no, but what about all the good stuff that I did? Doesn't that make up for it? I grew up Muslim, and the whole tenet of Islam is, yeah, you do some bad things, but as long as you do some five pillars, some good things, it'll make up for it. The Bible says that not even one good thing, not even a thousand good things can make up for one sin. And let me just ask you, if God put Adam out of the Garden of Eden for just one sin, what makes you think he'll let you into paradise with your millions of sins? Now, you're thinking, this doesn't feel fair to me. Hell, for eternity, for just a lifetime of sinning, the crime doesn't really equal the, that punishment, I don't think. Why would a lifetime of breaking the Ten Commandments equal an eternity in hell? Well, that is a just punishment because the severity of the punishment is always dependent upon the significance of the one that you sin against. The severity of the punishment is always dependent upon the significance of the person you sin against. For example, if I punch this pillar right here, there would be no penalty because it's not a person. If I punched a dog, I'd probably lose your respect. If I punched a cat, no one would care. If I punched one of you, I'd probably go to jail for a couple days, maybe get probation, pay a fine. I don't know. It depends how significant you are. Just for real. But if Joe Biden came in this room this morning, the president of the United States, and I assaulted him, I punched him in the face, which, um, let's be honest, Joe's looking a little frail nowadays. It wouldn't be great. A five-second decision. Me punching the president. A split second would result in what? Jail for a lifetime. A, a punishment completely disproportionate to the length of the crime. You see, the severity of the punishment is exponentially increased by the person that I sin against. And hell is forever because I have spent a lifetime assaulting the king of kings and lord of lords with my defiance. I have tarnished his kingdom. I have rebelled against his rule. And to break any of these laws is to make a direct assault on the king of kings himself. To worship another god is treason to the true god. To misuse God's name is to deny his honor. To steal is to deny his providence. To lie is to deny his truthfulness. Every violation of the law is an offense against the holy God. And that's what makes Israel so terrified here. They've defied the king. But I want you to notice what happens at the end. Look at how this foreshadows the gospel. Look how this foreshadows Easter. Verse 20, Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. Verse 21, the people stood far off. They're drawing away from God in fear. But Moses, what does he do? He draws near to the thick darkness where God was. The people pulled away, and Moses, the mediator between God and man, draws near. 
And the New Testament tells us that all of this is pointing to the mediator, mediator that was to come. The true and greater Moses, Jesus Christ. You see, Moses would later fail in Exodus, but Jesus, the greater mediator, would never fail. And he would press in to bridge a gap between God and sinful man. He lived a perfect life, spotlessly obeying the law. He never lied, not even once, not even an exaggeration. He told the truth even when it got him killed. He had no harmful, murderous thoughts, even to the people that murdered him. He cried out, Father, forgive them as they crucified him. Not one lustful glance. Every woman was safe and cared for in his presence. He never loved anything more than he loved God. In the desert, he said, Satan, go back to hell. He didn't just obey the Sabbath. He was the Lord of the Sabbath. He honored God's name all the way to the cross. And Jesus Christ is the ultimate mediator between man and God. One who perfectly obeyed the law. Galatians 4 says Christ was born under the law to redeem those under the law. Matthew 5 says he fulfilled the law in every respect. He who was held to the same standard of obedience that every single one of us has fallen short of. And yet he scored a 10 out of 10 every time. And the good news of the gospel is that the righteousness God demands from us is the righteousness God has supplied to us in Jesus Christ on the cross. He took your zero out of 10 and the punishment that came along with it and gave you all the blessings of his 10 out of 10. Second Corinthians 5 21 says for our sake, Jesus made him God made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ bore the curse. He bore the darkness of breaking the law so we would receive the blessing of having perfectly obeyed the law. And you will never, you will never understand the beauty of the resurrection until you see the grave that Jesus Christ lifted you out of. He went into our grave. Because we were the lawbreakers. His cross was my fate. His grave, our eternal destiny. Jesus took all that penalty gladly. He entered into our grave boldly. He shattered our shame completely when he walked out of that grave on Easter morning. And the only way the Bible says for you to be saved is to admit you're a sinner in need of a savior, that you're all the way on this side of the scale and there's nothing you can do to move forward, but you need him to live and die for you. All you need this morning is need. And yet sadly, so few people have it. So few people will admit it. I recognize it's Easter. And a lot of people come on Easter wanting to feel good. Wanting a feel good, go happy message from their pastor. But I love you too much not to tell you the whole truth. To not to reveal to you the entire scriptures. And the whole truth is that you will never appreciate Easter. You might wake up and think, why is this day such a big deal? You don't think it's a big deal because you don't understand why Easter had to happen. It was our sin and it was God's love that put Jesus on the cross. And it was his power over sin and death that brought him back to life. David Jeremiah tells the story of the great magician Houdini. He was regarded in his day as the world's greatest escape artist. Houdini had proven able to get himself out of any confinement, handcuffs, straitjackets, locked caskets, sealed up prison cells. He could get out of anything you bound him in, in less than a minute. There's actually only one recorded instance where the great Houdini failed to escape. He was touring the British Isles, and in a small town, he was invited to escape from a local jail cell. And Houdini said that this Local jail cell looked so ordinary that he thought it was a joke. He laughed. He said, I'll be out of this in 30 seconds. But after two hours of relentlessly trying to get out, unsuccessfully to pick the lock, he finally gave up. And in, in a moment of exhaustion and exasperation, Houdini leaned against the cell door, conceding failure. 
And when he did that, to his surprise, the door suddenly creaked open. Why? Because it wasn't locked to begin with. How many of us are staying in a prison, stuck behind an unlocked door? Jesus' blood has unlocked the cell that leads to your freedom. All you've got to do is lean on him. And one of our enemy's greatest deceptions is convincing us that like Houdini, we've got to strive and work and pick at the lock to obey all of these commandments so that God will finally let us in. We have to earn God's love through good works. But all you've got to do is lean on the door. All you've got to do is throw yourself on the grace of Jesus and let him carry you to God. Salvation is not what you do to save yourself. Salvation is what Jesus has already done to save you. We're not saved by our law keeping. We're saved by his law keeping. And no matter how great a sinner you are this morning, Jesus is a greater savior. His mercy is more powerful than your sin. And Jesus does not take bad people and make them good. He takes dead people and makes them alive. And the only way to be saved is to admit, I am a dying man or woman. And like Israel, we should be terrified because we stand between a holy God and justice. But in Christ, we've been made alive. And this is why Christianity hinges on Easter. It hinges on the resurrection. Because the resurrection means for us, if we throw ourselves on him, eternal security. Security that all my sins have actually been forgiven. Jesus died on the cross for my sins and he resurrected on Sunday. And his resurrection was a receipt. It was proof. It was evidence that he really did pay for what he paid for. That we really are safe. And if a man claims to be God lives a perfect life, says he's going to die for my sin, dies, and then resurrects from the dead. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and trust him, whatever he says about salvation. I'm going to go with the guy who rose from the dead when it comes to eternity. The resurrection also means enduring hope that one day death will die. I spoke to a, a guy this morning who has basically terminal cancer, and he said to me, the tomb is empty. The tomb is empty is is a declaration of hope that one day we will be resurrected like he was. Now death is like my car. It just takes me where I want to go. The resurrection means nothing is impossible, friend. You're suffering from nothing a good resurrection can't fix. Whatever it is that ails you, Jesus will resurrect you in new life. The young professional in this room who feels like their career is imploding or their personal life is is collapsing, you can look up at the heavens and say, the tomb is empty. Jesus will put this all together again. The person suffering from anxiety or depression in this room can look up at the heaven and say, the tomb is empty. Jesus will end my suffering. This is temporary. The person who's been divorced, or the person who's childless, the person who's lonely, can one day say, the resurrection means I'll have a family forever. The resurrection means that you and I have an eternal redemptive mission to reconcile sinners like us back to a holy God through the person of Jesus Christ. And we celebrate this morning because the tomb is still empty in Jerusalem. The Romans couldn't find him. The disciples couldn't find him. And he resurrected and they found him. And if Jesus walked out of that tomb, it doesn't matter if you grew up like a Muslim like me. It doesn't matter if you agree with the Bible or not. The only thing that matters is if Jesus rose from the dead. And if he did, he's worthy of your life. So come to Jesus this morning and receive resurrection hope. All you have to do is tell him, I'm done working my way to you. I'm on the evil side of the good and bad scale. I'm a sinner in need of grace. Save me and he will. D.A. Carson says that we start believing the gospel when we start talking about Christian theology using personal pronouns. Meaning, we don't just say Jesus died to save the world, though he did. But we start saying, Jesus died to save me. 
It's not Jesus' righteousness creates a record of salvation, though it's true. No, it's the righteousness of Christ has been credited to my account. The power of the resurrection now lives inside me. I want to encourage you to apply personal pronouns to the truth of the resurrection, whatever it is you're dealing with today. And if you don't know him, receive resurrection hope in the person of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. As we have our eyes closed and heads bowed, I want you to consider and think of Jesus, the real human person in history, hanging on the cross, dying though he did nothing wrong. And on the cross, see him. He is carrying the weight of your covetousness. He's paying for your lies. He's swallowing up all your murderous thoughts. He's being flogged for your adultery. He's being cursed because you blaspheme God. See Jesus Christ drinking the cup of God's wrath to the very last drop for you. If you're not a Christian, I want to invite you right now to tell Jesus, I'm done working my way to heaven. I want to throw myself on your grace and trust you to save me by faith. You live the life I could not live. You died the death I deserve. Today can be the day you're saved. And if you're a Christian in this room, I want to invite you to, to help, ask God to help you see your resurrection hope. There's nothing so bad in your life that a good resurrection cannot fix. Even in weeks where bridges collapse, friends die, things don't go the way we want them to, we look to the empty tomb and know that all sad things will one day come untrue. God, help us to apply the resurrection to our hearts this morning to really believe that we will come out of that grave like you did. There is no one impressive in this room. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. And Jesus, thank you for dying and resurrecting to save us. And we give you our whole lives in response. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.